Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That song's really about what we're all about, right? Let's get together and feel all right. Something yeah. about coming together in community that helps us remember who we are. So, good morning, everyone. I'm Reverend C.C. Coltrane. Welcome to Center for Spiritual Living, Greater Dayton. If this is your first time here, a special welcome to you. We love that you're spending your Sunday morning with us. And uh, we would appreciate it if you take just a minute to fill out that tear-off strip on the program cover and just drop it at the Welcome Center after the service so that we can send you a thanks for being with us message and uh, put you on our, our, every Wednesday I send out a little spiritual pick-me-up in the middle of the week. If you'd like to receive that, you can put your email address on there and we will add you to the list. We will not do anything else with your email, I promise. Giving our reading and invocation this morning is Lenza Smith. And our vigil holder is Linda Andriaco, and Lenza Smith and Andy Hawk will offer our interfaith candle lighting, which we do every week just to remind us that there is wisdom in every spiritual tradition on the planet and that we can learn and grow from paying attention to all of them. Our kids today are with Mark Fowler and I guess Stephanie and Tawn, if she's here. So they have a wonderful project today. I got a sneak preview the other day and it looks really fun. So we're just going to give them a quick blessing as they gather around Mark there and get ready to go do this fun project of self-discovery. So we simply acknowledge that Spirit shows shines so brightly through these kids that they are the very place where God shows up unfiltered and shiny and bright and teaches us all, reminds us all what we know. That life is good. That God is present and that we are beings of joy and love. I give great thanks for their presence in our midst and their participation in what's going on here today. I call it good and very good, and I say thank you, God, and so it is. So it is. Have a wonderful day, you guys. Love you. Have fun. Have fun, baby. <laughs> in your bulletin is a reminder about our school supply drive for Choices, which is an organization that helps kids successfully move through foster care and into the world instead of just having them age out and then they get kicked out the door. This is our first uh, connection with them, our first project with them, so we really want to make it good. Today was the deadline, but I'm going to give you till noon tomorrow, mainly because I haven't shopped yet. So we have till noon tomorrow to drop off school supplies from the list here at the center and then we'll get them over to... I've been. I've been crazy. I've been out of town. I've been running around. I came back to do a wedding last night, and here I am this morning. So, um, so we're, by noon tomorrow, and then we will deliver what we've put together to those kids so that they can successfully move into their last couple of years of high school and, or their first years of college with things like planners and paper and pens and stuff like that. Um, after service today, we'll have a welcome and hugs team. Hugs is what we call our ushers and greeters team. Uh, team meeting. So if you're interested in some really wonderful service uh, as a greeter or a welcome team member, please join us at noon in the community room, which is all the way in the back. We'd love to have you join that team. Of, it's a great way to get to know people in the congregation. It's a very easy way to serve. You can choose when you're available, when, when you can sign up to do that, and we really appreciate it. And please check your bulletin for other events that are coming up. The next Easy Breezy Riders 10-mile bike ride is August 25th at 9 a.m. There's a flyer in your bulletin. There's another couple of other things coming up. There's a, a Mandela workshop in October, and there's a, I think, I think it's Forgiveness workshop uh, in September, and we'll keep you posted about those things so you can mark your calendar, and they're either on a flyer or on the very back of your bulletin. Finally, if there's something that you'd like prayer support for, our practitioners are here to pray with you after the service. They're wearing a white or teal stole. Just walk up to one of them and ask them, and they will take you into a quiet corner and give you the gift of some, of, of uh, just a deep spiritual knowing. That's what they've trained and studied and practiced doing is knowing the truth even when we can't. And it's their gift to you on Sundays with some really deep love. So with that, we're going to turn it back over to the Higher Mind Band. All right, all right, all right. Where everybody needs love. 
we light the first candle in honor of Christianity. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. We light the second candle in honor of Judaism. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Set a guard over my mouth. Lord, keep watch over the door of my lips. We light the third candle in honor of Islam. Hold on to your salah, your prayer, because if you lose that, you will lose everything else. We light the fourth candle in honor of Buddhism. Evoking the presence of great compassion, let us fill our hearts with our own compassion toward ourselves and towards all living beings. Let us pray that all living beings realize that they are all brothers and sisters, all nourished from the same source of life. We light the fifth candle in honor of Native American religions. Rise with the sun to pray. Pray often and alone. The Great Spirit will listen only if you speak. We light the sixth candle in honor of Hinduism. Prayer is the key of the morning and the bolt of the evening. We light the seventh candle in honor of spirituality of the Marai people. <laughs> May the peace of the sky above, of the earth below, and of, of the all-embracing universe rest upon us all. Beautiful, it is life. Today's reading um, goes with our theme of spiritual mind treatment. Treatment deals with thoughts. Perfection is already accomplished. It was and is and will remain. There is a perfect idea back of every organ, and there is a perfect actor back of all life. The more completely you realize this, the more effective will be your mental treatment. Because this treatment is a conscious pronouncement about the spiritual self and its relationship to the universe or God. Take a moment to take these words within and contemplate them with me. <coughs> Centered in this infinite moment of love, peace and joy and light, we are in a paradise. We are so blessed this morning and in this day. And I know that everyone that has come here and is participating in this service is divinely blessed. I know that our children are so adored and uplifted and blessed in all that they are doing today. I know that the words that Reverend Cece speaks are inspired and that it is spirit that is speaking through and as her. I know that each and every person here is uplifted 
and imbued with the power and the love and the presence of the divine that is moving in and through and as all of us. I know that this is a blessed time for us together. And I say thank you. So be it. I think my microphone needs some more duct tape, Kenny. <laughs> Don't we all? Don't we all, yes. We all need some more duct tape in our lives, right? So as you might have surmised, we're spending some time on our chief, what might be our chief spiritual practice, which is affirmative prayer, because it blends together the central points of our philosophy, the central truths of our philosophy, with the spiritual practices of meditation, contemplation, and affirmation in a really beautiful and powerful and usable way. And I'm frankly really glad we're doing this exploration because it's way too easy for me to forget how powerful the practice is. And I'm probably not the only one. Am I? No, I didn't think so. I forget how much it can change my life just like that. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, called, a, he created this particular form of affirmative prayer and he called it spiritual mind treatment because it involves applying a curative to our own minds, to the old patterns of negative thinking and the self-deprecation and fear that we all seem to be so susceptible to. We all seem to be more than willing to, you know, put ourselves down and be more fearful than we are hopeful some days. And in his book, Living the Science of Mind, which is sort of the book that we're using this year, he wrote this. He said, prayer in its truest sense is not a petition, not a supplication, not a wail of despair, although sometimes it is. He said, it's not, it's not those things. It's rather an alignment, a unifying process, which takes place in the mind as it reaches to its divine self and to that power which is greater than human understanding. In the act of such prayerful and reverent communion, one senses the unity of good, the completeness of life, and at times the veil of doubt is lifted and the face of reality with a capital R appears. It's such a beautiful boiled down essence of the first part of affirmative prayer because it begins in that, as I said last week, in that place of mysticism. That's what the unifying process that Holmes is talking about is. It is the process of opening ourselves up to the awareness of the one, the one that we're all part of, of our unity with that divine thing. And we begin by dealing with our thoughts, because our thoughts are often of separation. Our thoughts are of having to go it alone. We have to make this work. Our thoughts are about being in a cold and scary and unsupportive universe, and here we are all, all alone trying to make something happen. Our thoughts are often of things that block us from being able to sense that greater presence, that greater life that we're part of. things that block us from moving our awareness to that place of unity between that which is in us and that which is everywhere. What, what Ralph Waldo Emerson called the oversoul. And so today I want to talk about how we do that, how we, we move our consciousness into that, into that realm. And, and I mentioned last week that Dr. Holmes prescribed something. He said, each day we take time to sit down, be quiet, compose our minds, and think about God. And again, the God I'm talking about is not a larger person out there somewhere. It is, it is the universe itself. It is life itself. It is the, the fabric and the energy and the form and the emptiness and the consciousness that is the ground of everything, the ground of all being. So when we think about this spirit, God, consciousness, the universe, when we think about its allness, that it is everywhere, 
and we think about its manifestation, you know, manif manifestation that shows up all around us and is so creative and so interesting and, and varied. We, we think about the people we love. We think about the pets we love. We think about ourselves and the miracle of the body that works as well as it does for a very long time without our conscious direction. It's kind of amazing to me every time I stop and realize what's going on at any given moment right here, you know? We think about sunrises and sunsets and trees and plants and the whole planet and its beauty and the, the amazing powerful things that exist on it, on it that sometimes seem to get in our way like volcanoes, but which one was there first? You know, it is an amazing, powerful presence, this volcano. The Hawaiians actually give it the status of God, and I can see why. Um, those things have been happening. They're part of the fabric of this planet. There's new Hawaii being created right now. Even though some people's houses are being destroyed, there's new land being made. It's just awe-inspiring if we let it be. We can think about wildlife. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was driving to the cabin my sister and I rented in Hawking Hills, and I looked up, and there was this magnificent young male deer with those little knobby, fuzzy antlers and glossy fur and this beautiful physique, and he was just standing there looking at me, and it was breathtaking. I see that kind of amazing, beautiful, breathtaking life, and I think, wow. This is some place we live, isn't it? So we continue to think consciously and intentionally in those kinds of realms, seeing the manifestations of the divine all around us, seeing them. And then we begin to shift, we can begin to shift the old patterns of thinking that we've been doing forever. We've been doing forever. When we train ourselves to see the wonder and the beauty and the joy, instead of the problems and the suffering and the quote-unquote bad things that are happening. And I want to be really clear, we never deny that there are problems. We never deny that suffering happens in the world. It does. We simply acknowledge what's true, and that is that there is more ease than suffering in our world. There is more love than hate in our world. There is more good than bad in our world, and we get to choose where to focus. We train ourselves to see that divine expression in all things, in all people, in all situations, because if it's the ground of being, it's there. Somebody may be acting poorly on top of it, but it's still there, and we have to train ourselves to see it. We begin to see life from the positive side of the ledger rather than the negative. And what happens when we begin to see life from the positive side of the ledger is we feel larger, we feel lighter, we feel more spacious, we feel emboldened to be different. And we bring that difference into the world in what we say and in what we do. And as we just continue in that vein, we continue contemplating what's good and beautiful, what's joyful and loving, we start to feel ourselves part of this fabric, this infinite whole, this oneness that I call God. And sometimes, sometimes, we start to feel our edges melt away. We start to lose the boundary that keeps us in this aloneness that we can sometimes feel. We start to feel like we're, we're merging with everything it is. And, and then we can just simply pause there and realize, here we are. And even if we get close to that, even if we get to the point where we're, you know, just seeing more, more largely, then a thought inevitably will come up that will, will try to distract us. It will try to take us back to fear. And we simply thank it and let it slip on through. If you have trouble focusing on the positive, if you have trouble seeing that there's more good in the world than bad, I want to 
invite you to consider something Ernest Holmes said. He said, to affirm the presence of God is better than to deny the presence of evil. And he doesn't mean that there's an embodiment of evil to deny, because we don't, I don't believe Satan exists except in our own minds. But what he's saying is, when we spend time denying the presence of evil rather than looking at and affirming the presence of good, we continue to give evil a larger place and more energy in our own thoughts. As my colleague Reverend Edward Viyun put it, there are only two possibilities. Either God is all there is, or God is not all there is. And the first is infinitely better. The first is infinitely better. When we can, when we can you know, contemplate that and move towards a place where we can stake to ourselves with full faith and belief that God is all there is, it's an enormous opening in our own being. It's an enormous opening in our own consciousness where something good can happen. So that's what I'm talking about when I, when I say we, we're training ourselves to think from the positive side of the ledger rather than the negative. You know, we deeply consider this idea that the divine is present everywhere even when we can't see it. That um, every speck of matter and, and even in the places we call empty and in every animal and every plant and every human and every creature and every situation it's there, regardless. And, and we stay in the contemplation until we are beginning to get comfortable with that idea instead of being frightened by it. And then we can move even more deeply into that mysticism by realizing that if that's true, if that idea is true, if the divine is present everywhere, if it is all there is, then it's here too. It's right where we are. It's present in us. It's present in those people we love. It's present in our funny little pets. It's present in sunrises and trees and clouds and raindrops and sun and all of that. And we just start to think differently about things. And then we start to naturally feel differently about things, to see differently into things, to have a different perception of reality the reality around us. Holmes said, we turn from the relative and the limited to to that greater unlimited because to stare at limitation is to impress it upon our minds and accentuate the state of consciousness which produced it. To stare at limitation, you know, most of us do that all the time. How many of you wake up when the alarm goes off and say, Hallelujah, brand new day, yay! No. You probably roll over and swear at the alarm clock, right? I do. Oh, God, it's time to get up. I don't want to. Um, we just do that. It's what we do. And, and we drag ourselves out of bed grumbling about ha having to go to work. And when we think about doing something nice, like going somewhere we really want to go or buying something we need, the first thing we think is, I can't afford that. Or we want to do something physical and we instantly start thinking about our physical shortcomings instead. We think about can't instead of can and don't instead of do. And what would life be like if we could eradicate that constant leap toward limitation? Wouldn't that be good? If we didn't have all those negative thoughts about whatever it is we're looking at, I think I can confidently say we'd be happier. We'd be less tense. We'd be more joyful. We'd be less burdened. We'd be more likely to go out into the world and take positive action than to think of all the reasons we can't. There's nothing I can do. Want to bet? There's always something you can do, even if it's to be friendly to some neighbor that you've never been friendly to before, even if it's to speak to the person who's bagging your groceries by name. There's always something we can do to drip a little bit more good into the world. But we can't do it if we're focused on the limitation part. So we spend quite a bit of prayer 
working in our own consciousness to come into that sense of alignment, that work, that unifying process that is the mind reaching to its divine self and, and that self reaches to that self which is greater than human understanding. And when we do that, we can start to see what we're thinking. It's a real interesting phenomenon, but it's really, it's really the truth. If I want to think about that, everything unlike that is going to pop up for me to look at. Everything in my own mind that says, not that, not that, not that, is going to pop up. And, 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 and I guess what we have to learn to do, the way I try to do it with myself, is not to take it so seriously. I know that most of that, not that, not that, not that, happens because of the brain that evolved in me and in all of you. We still have the brain of that itty bitty ancestor, little itty bitty thing looks like a vole. That's, you know, that was where, that was the early mammal. And it had a brain that had to be on high alert because it, was, it could get squished, it could get swa swooped, something could swoop down from the sky and grab it. Something could lean over, some large lizardy looking thing could lean over and say, mmm, dinner. It was a scary thing to be alive and high alert was necessary. We still have that. It never went away. Something bigger was just overlaid on top of it. So our small mammal brain is still going, ooh, 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 it's dangerous. And this part of our brain is what we have to learn to say, I'm not going to give you any weight. I'm just not going to pay attention to you today. Sure, I suppose it's, you know, entirely possible in the, in the world of infinite possibility that I'll meet a saber-toothed tiger today, but it's so unlikely I'm just not going to give it any weight, right? It's even less likely I'm going to meet a Tyrannosaurus Rex. So thank you for sharing, but I'm moving on now. I kind of have to talk to my brain that way sometimes because the fear that can come up is absurd. It's, it is as absurd as a saber-toothed tiger on Benfield Drive. <laughs> doesn't stop my brain from coming up with it. I just have to say, okay, that's what you're doing today. This is where I'm going. This is what I want to look at. Instead, I want to look at the fact that I have people who I love in my life. I have everything that I need to stay alive and be and to thrive is there. I have a great place to work. I have the best job in the world. I have all these good things. That's what I want to focus on. We spend quite a bit of time simply getting through that which is unlike what we're trying to reach in our consciousness. We just, instead of, you know, spending time with the, oh God, I have to get up and get ready to go to work, we say, thank you for sharing. I have a whole day in which to do new and wonderful things. And we get to see then how we sabotage our own joy and our own energy and our own happiness. Then we're at a place we can make a different choice. We can change it. So in the process of spiritual mind treatment, the curative is a new thought pattern. We think about the joy instead of about the grief. We choose to notice what's beautiful instead of what's not. We make a choice to see more of spirit wherever we look and less of what's been created by our habitual thinking, our negativity, our judgment, by the frightened part of us. We make a choice to step into the realm of the positive. And we just keep doing that until we train our minds to dwell there, to see what's possible instead of what the circumstances seem to be, to see that we can always make a different choice than just react out of our old habits. We train our minds to dwell in the good and the beautiful and the positive, and dwell from the good and the beautiful and the positive. Have you ever heard of Mike Dooley? Anybody yes. here ever heard of Mike yes. Dooley? Yes. Yeah, he's a, he's a popular teacher, and he said this great thing. He said, dwelling from, not upon, the state, the space you want to inherit, it's the fastest way to change absolutely everything. Dwelling from, not upon, the space you wish to inherit is the fastest way to change absolutely everything. That's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to begin to dwell from the wide and loving space 
we want to inherit, we want to live in. When we dwell from the awareness that spirit is everywhere, when we dwell, when we act from spirit, then we act, we act from that place instead of to, instead of pleading, instead of looking for something out there, we act from it. And so when we move in the world, the divine in us reaches out to the divine in others. We speak to them differently, we see them differently, we hear them differently, and that makes an enormous difference in the way we, ex we have exchanges with them. Even when it's somebody, I had an interesting conversation this past weekend, I was with my family and my niece has just married a guy who's about as politically opposite as you can get from me. And we had the most wonderful conversations because we were both willing to show up from that space and listen and learn from each other and love each other. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. He and I will never see eye to eye on certain issues, but he's a great guy. And, and when we can do that, everything changes. When we can do that with every situation, when we can simply see from that place we want to live in. Dr. Holmes said, prayer then is communion. It's communion. And this communion pronounces life to be good. Prayerful communion ascends to that place where unity has not yet become variety, where the unformed one is ready to take any specific shape. In this act of communion, the individual becomes co-partner with the eternal and gives, time to birth, gives birth to time, space, and conditions. But before we can give birth to different time and space and conditions, we have to train our minds to dwell in that different time, that different space, those different conditions. And that's really what spiritual mind treatment is all about. It's all about training our minds to live in a different realm, to stay on the positive side of the ledger. It does not, like I say, it does not mean that we ignore the things that happen that aren't positive. It means that when we go out into the world and we want to do something about those things, we do so from a place of possibility and love and no judgment and and the energy of change, the energy of change that love brings. So let's pray together now. Let's spend some time in this place of prayerful communion right now. So just join me first of all in taking a big breath. And as you think about your breathing, Think about how remarkable it is that without your conscious participation, oxygen comes in, moves into your lungs, moves across the barriers of blood vessels into the bloodstream and attaches itself to these funny little molecules that take it everywhere. And it's taken into individual cells as fuel so that the breath you take in now will fuel the handshake that you have in the next moment. The breath you take in now will fuel a brilliant idea in your mind. The breath you take in now will fuel the digestion of your breakfast. It is the most precise and amazing machinery and it goes on all day, every day, all night, every night, without our even thinking. What an amazing thing. And moving beyond the breath, thinking about this beautiful day that lies ahead of us. This green and verdant and fertile world with crops growing in our fields and fruit growing on our trees and vegetables and flowers growing in our gardens and oh that pesky lawn growing in our yards and all that is happening simply because the sun converts itself into energy that we use it goes on all day every day 
It goes on all night, every night, without our conscious participation. It's a miracle. And our planet that is right exactly the distance it should be from the sun in order that all these things can happen, in order that somehow life evolved from non-living and multi-celled life evolved from a single cell and plants and amphibians and fish and birds and reptiles and mammals and humans evolved from all of that. It is the most amazing system, the most amazing, miraculous thing. And we go out to the stars and we see billions of stars and these amazing things called star factories where deep in, deep in space new, fact, new stars are being born out of these nebula in such beautiful and amazing ways and other stars are dying and creating elements that make up all that exists. And it goes on every day, all day, every night, all night, without our conscious participation. And what ties it all together is that the very cells of our bodies are made from the, the same elements that came from those exploding stars so long ago. And the elements of tomorrow will come from those stars that are exploding right now. And it goes on and on and on infinitely. It's always happening with precision, with care, with an eye for such beauty. It is the mechanism of life itself. It is that intelligence that I think of when I think of the word God. It is the creativity that God is, present everywhere, all the time, creating, being beauty, being joy, being life, being excitement, being well-being and ease and grace, being everything that is. And we are created of it and through it. We are of it. It is all that we are. Right where we are, that life force, that love force, that creativity exists and expresses. And so as we find that place deep within us that connects with everything, we pause. We let ourselves feel the vastness of spirit. It reaches out to the furthest edges of the universe and beyond, for it is always expanding. And it is as close as that breath. It is as personal as that heartbeat. We simply acknowledge our oneness with all that is. And as we do that, we remember that it is a force, a power, a life that works by means of love. Its greatest motive power is love. And that love flows in our veins. It enters our body as we breathe. It enlivens our thoughts about ourselves, about others, about life, about the planet. It widens and deepens us so that we, can, we become places of transformation. When we speak to others, the love that we are simply shows ahead of everything else. It allows us to see others with divine eyes. It allows us to see ourselves with those same divine eyes. It allows us to know that all that we do is an act of God. It informs our thinking. It becomes our habitual place of dwelling. And as we dwell from this place, we grow, we expand, we love more deeply. We express ourselves more fully. We allow the creativity that we are born with to come out in whatever way is uniquely ours. And this is good. For this I am so grateful. 
for this time of simply pausing to remember that deep connection with the all that is. I know that each one of us spends a moment, perhaps a fleeting moment, perhaps a, de a dedicated practice, pausing to place themselves in the heart of God and to think about that each day so that over time our thinking comes to dwell there, comes to see the good and the beautiful, the true, the hopeful, the joyful, the healthy, the creative, the abundant. And we bless our world as a result. So it is in deep gratitude that I simply turn all of this, I release it all, I let it go. It is nothing that I have to do, it is simply mine to acknowledge. I know that the universe, that which supports each one of us and says yes to us, has already taken it and made it so. So in deep gratitude, we say together, and so it is.
contribute to support the work of this amazing spiritual community. When we give to the center, what we're supporting is inclusivity and welcome and spiritual growth and awakening to our own magnificence and participation in a world that works for everyone. But that's what we're really trying to create. That is our vision, and everything we do is aimed towards furthering that world. So I ask you to give what you can give to support us, and we appreciate it more than words can say. So take your gift in your hands or your heart if you give electronically as I do, and let's affirm. I know the activity of abundance. I know the activity of abundance. In my life and in this center. In my life and in this center. I give and receive generously. I give and receive generously. From the everlasting flow of good. From the everlasting flow of good. And so it is. Jimmy on a song by Tom Petty. As soon as I get ready for it. <laughs> and we're ready for it. Ready? One, two, three, and... <laughs> Well, I 
We can do it again. <laughs> One more time! It's such a fun song. It's such a fun song. I just want to say thank you to all of you for being here today and making this service possible. And thanks to our ushers and greeters, our practitioners, the welcome team, the guys in the band, of course. Thank you all. And all of you. And all of you. Let's stand for a closing affirmation. Our closing song is A Light in This World. I relax into the presence and peace of spirit. I relax into the presence and peace of spirit. I allow my thoughts, I allow my thoughts to focus on the good and the beautiful. I know I am one with all that is. I know that I am one with all that is. And so it is. And so it is. Have a great week. Yeah.